Well, praise the Lord, another wonderful Sunday. And um, as we uh, spoke about uh, the last uh, Sunday on being like Jesus, and uh, today I want to count on the fact of uh, uh, more, more on the area of uh, being like Jesus. But being like Jesus is not just... Um, uh, growing to be like him, uh, it is also important to experience what he experienced, except for the atonement experience. There is no way any one of us can do what Jesus did. And we definitely need his redemption of our lives and the things he paid a price for us so that we don't have to pay the same price. It is a gift given unto us. As we aim towards being like Jesus and walking like Jesus, we need to keep this thing in mind. There are some things in Jesus' life that we can experience like he experienced. There are some things in Jesus' life we can never do. And that those things are the things that he paid the price so that we don't have to pay a price. And that's the uh, joy of salvation that he has given to us. He did this so that we don't have to do it. There are some things that we can identify that he did it for us like uh, dying on the cross for us and uh, praying all the prayers for us, uh, resurrecting, uh, imparting his resurrection life to us. Uh, these two things are very clear, the cross and the resurrection. But what is not reverent is Jesus' role as a high priest for us. He has already prayed us through. There is no way that Jesus' prayer in John 17 will fail to come to pass. It is definite that it will succeed. Jesus will see his glorious church. The only thing that we look at as we compare Jesus' prayer for our life is how much we cooperate with him. And how much of our free will are willing to line up? As a high priest, he cannot force us to make decisions that only we can make. But if we are yielded, pliable, uh, like clay to the potter, then he can mold and make our, our life as he wants us. Let us, for example, illustrate with two disciples. One is Judas. The other is Peter. Judas failed, Peter failed. But Peter was molded to Jesus. And Jesus did say, I have prayed for you. And when you are returned, strengthen your brethren. So his prayer for Peter was successful. And we wonder, did he pray for Judas? I'm sure he did. He interceded for all his disciples. He cannot choose Judas Iscariot and not pray for him. He will have to function as a high priest. But yet, his intercession that was made for Judas Iscariot was not successful because Judas was not yielded or responsive to the time Jesus kept trying to warn him and tell him that he knew what is going on in his life. Just like Jesus Christ died on the cross for all the sins of the world, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus did it for every single human being, even those who today are suffering in hell, they could have received 
what Jesus has for them. But they were not in a position to receive or too far away in their walk with uh, in the world and the devil for them to respond to God's call if they ever heard it unless they're too far away in their walk to even hear God. But Jesus died on the cross for every human being that is suffering in hell today. They just did not make it. They did not respond. Jesus cannot force a person to receive what he has given to them freely. So as we observe and look at what Jesus has done for us and emulate him, we also need to understand that to do the works of Jesus, which is this series on doing the works of Jesus, we need some things we can do because he did for us and enable us to reach the position that we cannot reach ourselves. And those are definitely in the Bible. He gave us the gifts of the Spirit and salvation, eternal life, resurrection life, atonement, in order for us to be like him. This is the gift part that we receive. Now, the gift part is a really very great. Anyone and everyone who received the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ becomes a son of God. John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. And has authority to be a son of God. To be like Jesus. And that is a tremendous gift. If anyone avails himself of this gift, including the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the callings of God, like in um, Ephesians 4, it will enable us to be like Jesus. But let me put it all in a more systematic way so that you don't fail to receive this gift part of being like Jesus. Because there are certain gift parts that we need to identify very clearly and nothing to do with our works, but we receive it by the grace of God. John chapter 1, verse 12. Now, in this first part, I'm just going to talk about being like Jesus and the gift part they give to us. The subtitle for today's sermon uh, on doing the works of Jesus Christ is actually experiencing Jesus' experience. Uh, experiencing all that Jesus experienced. And there are some things that we experience as a gift in Him. But there are some things that we need to go through the same process that He went through to experience it. So there are two major ways. The first way is by grace and by the gift of God. Uh, uh, where are we heading in this uh, teaching today? Basically, we have to be like Jesus to do the works of Jesus Christ. That is a very obvious uh, statement. And sound theology to know you have to be like Jesus to do the works of Jesus. Now we go one step further. In order to be like Jesus, we have to experience what he experienced. In order to Ghana receive all that we need to receive from our point of view. We have to think like Jesus, behave like Jesus, have the heart of Jesus and speak like Jesus, be renewed in our DNA like Jesus, in order to do the works of Jesus. It is a very obvious conclusion. The question of the how is here, that there is a two-part way in becoming like Jesus. One, we can receive it through the grace of Jesus as a gift, but it's only half of the message. Because there are some things that demand our 
our uh, human experience to go through what he experienced. Remember when he made this statement uh, of the disciples and they wanted to be like him, sit on the right hand and left hand. And, they, and Jesus asked them, are you able to be baptized with the same baptism, implying baptism of fire, that I'm baptized with? And they so confidently say, yes, we are. You know, And he's talking about the baptism of suffering. They are willing and can suffer, uh, willing to suffer, like Jesus suffered. And of course, I think they know not what they say. So they confidently say yes. And then Jesus later on says, indeed, you will be baptized the same baptism that I've been baptized with, talking about the baptism of fire and suffering, in order to be like him. There are some things that Jesus suffered for us, but there are some things that we have to also suffer. Remember Jesus spoke about tribulations, suffering, and then when Paul was converted, he says he's a vessel chosen by me to suffer. Don't forget, he's chosen to suffer. Yes, he's chosen to be apostle to Gentiles. To bear my name to the Jews and to Gentiles. Yes, I, I know that part. But don't forget, he also mentioned in Acts 9 to analyze that he's a vessel chosen to suffer. And Paul himself says, when he wrote to the Colossians in chapter 1, that he bear the sufferings of Christ. And just as Christ suffered to bring the message of the gospel to us, Paul has to suffer to bring the God message of the gospel to those who are to be born again. So in that manner, he cannot take Jesus' suffering that he don't have to suffer. He himself has to bear some sufferings to bring the gospel to places which he now represents Jesus in going to. And he said he bear the sufferings of Christ. And this part, is an experiential part. Something that is, uh, we have to experience it ourselves and receiving the gift of Jesus' atonement does not exempt us from that suffering. So the disciples, when they answer, yes, we can be baptized the same baptism as you've been baptized with, they know not what they say. Because to reach his level, they cannot get the gift of suffering, you know, like Jesus suffered for you, so you don't have to suffer anymore. Yes, only in atonement. But as a Christian and as a, an apostle like Paul or a prophet, there are sufferings that you have to suffer to reach your greatness. And it is fair to, in God. Because only when you have suffered to that extent, when you are promoted by God, you will never be proud again. Because the suffering will have knocked out all sin nature in your life. I am fascinated by what uh, Colin said he dreamt. In the real spiritual world where I'm in charge of many things in the spiritual realm, in my mansion, there is an attachment to a library. And I'm like ascribed to God, like Enoch you know, to a certain extent. And in that library, some of you have visited and you have seen your own life book. And Colin, when you were dreaming that dream, that is a spiritual place. I believe you visited and I met you there. And you were allowed to remember the spiritual experience as a dream. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a whole library of which I am uh, in charge of. And um, not everyone has access. And I'm glad that you were able to access that library in order to gain certain spiritual knowledge and wisdom and enable you to do the work of God on earth. Uh, the library is very extensive. I have visited my mansion and the library that is there. It's just uh, 
like hidden uh, inside the throne room area and the entrance is on the left and the right side before the sea of glass and in that library uh, many of you were trained before you came and on the shores of the sea of glass um, we were commissioned and sent forth uh, it's the heavenly place uh, where we were blessed and sent forth to this earth, if any of you have any memories of that. So there is that library. There uh, is a predestination that we have, and all things ordained to take place will, of course, take place. Now let's get to our topic and point about um, the things that we can be like Jesus a uh, two-point area. Number one is to receive what Jesus did for us as a redemption and atonement. And that we receive by grace and by His gifts. The other is to receive it by experiencing the same things that He went through. And that's important. So I'm touching on the first point. And today's subtitle is like experiencing Jesus experience. And there's an apostrophe after uh, the word Jesus experiences. Experiencing Jesus experiences. The first part is what he did for us and as we identify and become one with his experience at atonement for us, we receive that part as a gift and as a grace. Nothing you can do about, no amount of prayer, no amount of works, no amount of anything from us can qualify you for that. It is purely grace. It's for us to receive it as grace and a gift. And one of those things in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. It says here, He came to his own, and his own did not receive But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This part, to have the right to become a child of God, is a gift and is given to us freely. And here's the other part in the book of uh, Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11, 12. As he ascended on high, he gave gifts. The Bible tells us um, he gave gifts to us. He gave gifts to man. The prophecy says in verse 8, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Among the gifts he gave is in verse 11. He, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Don't forget, these are gifts. Jesus stood in all five offices. He was apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Paul stood in three offices. He was apostle, he was teacher, and he was evangelist. Of course, he was also a prophet before he became an apostle. And originally, I have always thought when I was called in the ministry before this end time move, I knew I was like Paul called to be apostle and evangelist and a teacher. And I enjoyed those ministries. And through time, <clears throat> I discovered 
that Paul in Acts 13, verse 1 and 2, was also a prophet. And I had begun to accept my prophetic calling as much as my apostolic. If you hear me from the early days, I used to tease that I'm not a prophet. You will never hear me say that again anymore. And, um, and I realized that the apostolic includes the prophetic. That's why in the Old Testament, there was no apostles. But the true apostle of God that is called uh, is also prophetic. And we grow up from the prophet's office into planting of churches. There are, of course, those who are prophets, like Agabus in the Bible in Acts 11, where he manifested and functioned, uh, who don't grow into apostolic, but they remain at the highest as a prophet. Kenneth Hagin was not an apostle. He was, uh, uh, he was not a church planter, and he was a traveling ministry. And Kenneth Hagin was a prophet and a teacher. Uh, there are some people, like T.L. Osborne, he's called purely to be an evangelist. John Austin uh, was called to be a pastor, and he, and he loves that office. Lester Samuel uh, would have been was an apostle, and he is a prophetic element also. He plants churches. So we do have in our modern days different uh, fivefold offices, same like in the Bible time. You have Peter, who was an apostle to the uh, Jews, and uh, then there is um, John, the apostle, and uh, he went to several places, plant church. But John, the apostle, was also John the prophet. He was told to prophesy. Uh, when he ate the little book in Revelation chapter 10 to many nations. And his last book was the book of Revelations. And that is a prophetic book that established the fact that he is a prophet. Jesus was all fivefold ministry. And I realized that at the end time, I never myself realized it was possible until this end time move. As God began to reveal more, and God says, you have to be like Jesus. And part of being like Jesus, since Jesus is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, you have to also stand in all five offices. I say, I don't know of a man alive, a man or woman alive who stood in all five offices in history, in the Bible, in, the, um, in, in our modern era. I said, you know, I said, how is that possible? And I said, wouldn't it be too much? And that was in my early days in this end time move. As I began to accept that I was a prophet, uh, something that I used to joke about that I was not. And as a result, God tried to raise prophets around me to, to, to uh, uh, enhance and multiply the ministry because it takes all the five four officers working together to reach that fullness. And um, finally, I don't know why the prophets don't last long. I guess I can. I do know. I do know the answer because they were not established in the written word, and all they have is a spoken word, and. And there can be a lot of misinterpretation of spoken word and visions and revelations, especially when you're not deeply rooted in the written word. You see what the difference it makes when you're deeply rooted in the written word? Like Apollos. The moment Apollos received just a tiny little bit of new revelation, he could absorb it, expand it faster than any other ministry in the book of Acts. And in the end, he grew until he was compared to Peter and even Paul in the Corinthian church. And you can read a bit about his history, short history in the book of Acts, where even Aquila and Priscilla had more revelation and understanding of the gospel that Paulus did not have. But the moment 
that revelation was imparted to Apollos, Apollos absorbed it, expanded it, got deeper in it, can argue about it deeper, because he was solid man who, the Bible gives these words, mighty in scriptures. That means he was very powerful in the written word. And I encourage each one of you, that even in this end time, when we see a lot of visions and revelations, don't neglect something that you can do. Whether it's God give you a gift or not, you can become a master of the written word. All you have to do is read the Bible as many times as possible. Study the Bible as many times as possible. That is not something that you're limited to by any gifting by God. It's limited to the fact how much you want to study the Bible and how much you love the Bible. Even when I was a young believer, I have a love for the Word. The first thing I wanted to do was outline the whole Bible so I can remember it. And I did. I started. And then I read through the first time. I was so happy. Then I read through the second time. I was very happy. And then I read the Bible in different versions. And now I have the Bible in my head, like a walking Bible. And I can close my eyes and think about each chapter. And I still, uh, there are some places that I don't have all the scriptures. But I remember that the first uh, memorizing that I did uh, was not just scriptures verses that uh, we were taught to memorize verses in my follow-up program, the Navigators pro pro program, and memorize salvation scriptures and basic scriptures. But I wanted to memorize the Bible. And the first book that I attempted was the Gospel of John. I don't know why, but uh, I chose that because it was more interesting to me. Over time, I found that uh, I did not have to firstly try to memorize but by constantly reading the Bible, in many versions, I have a map inside me of where each part of the Bible is and what each part of the Bible says. Uh, like Apollos, it was something, I don't think it's a gift, but if you desire to have it, I can encourage you and pray that you would love the Bible as much. And you can develop it. Whether you're apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or none of the above, you can be mighty in the scriptures. What, what is to stop you from being mighty in the scriptures? After all, uh, some of you might be very good at movie dramas. You could tell me the whole story. And uh, you might be good at uh, certain books or, or gardening that you read about or something. So why not turn the interest into the Bible? And I always encourage uh, Bible students, especially those called to the ministry. I say there's one thing that you, you need to have. Know the Bible like the back of your hand. The sad thing is most people don't even know the back of their hand. But when you know the Bible like the back of your, ha your hand, as the English expression goes, whether you're prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or apostle, it will definitely make you stand head and shoulders above everyone else in that same calling. You will be like an Apollos who received the same amount of revelation, yet you're mightier than everyone because mighty in scriptures. So there you go. We're talking about some things that you can do on your own and not the gift of God. But God said about five four offices. And in this move, it took me some time, especially when in 2013, with the failure of the uh, seven thunders, uh, and he did not discern uh, that the angel that he saw towards the end on the last Friday meeting before the 23rd of September. So 23rd is a Sunday, 22nd would be Saturday. So 21st of September on the Friday meeting. Uh, it was reported by some of the leaders for me. It's the most oppressive online prayer. Uh, anyone gone through and people were asked to prophesy and they did not succeed well. 
to see in the spirit now. And uh, because he did not discern that the rainbow looking angel was an angel of light from Satan. Having open visions, I realize now, doesn't give you an advantage over another person who does not have open vision. So some of you who think <clears throat> that you need open visions to reach your fullness, you are mistaken. When God gives gifts, there are different types of gifts He gives people. It so happened that the former seven thunders uh, was struck by lightning. And it remained, the ability remained. In my ministry, I met three other people with open visions. One was a lady. And when you see in the spirit, you see things that you can't describe. And some people thought that she was crazy. <clears throat> but it was in my Singapore ministry that I met her. And I found she was quite stable. She just didn't have enough word to explain. They, they have a written word to explain what she was seeing. And so as a result, uh, she be, I mean, people thought that she was mentally troubled. And uh, another was uh, more a child who had it for some time, but for some reason must have lost it because uh, the parents didn't allow the child to grow in that. And uh, as a result of unbelief and rejection of the gift, got stopped. Another person had it when uh, in early days, but us couldn't take it and was frightened. And when we reject the gift, the gift stopped operating. Open vision is just one of the 12 gifts of the Spirit. It's called the gift of discerning of spirits. And in our modern era, the Lord has taught me how discerning of spirits work. And I, I am able to help a person into seeing in the Spirit. And I realized seeing in the spirit got different degrees. Uh, there are those that see in the wavelength of the natural eyes, and that will be like open vision. Then there are those who are able to see in the different wavelength, and it appears like a vision, more like an imaginative vision, which they cultivate to be very accurate. So there are different degrees of seeing. I also realized that when a person has open vision, there are also some things they cannot see in the spirit. And one time I could see, and I said, hey, why the, the prophet could not see? He could only see like a light. I see clearly a form. Then I realized that even in the spiritual world, angels can appear at different frequencies. And if you're operating at a certain frequency, you can't see higher frequencies. It might be invisible to you. Uh, it look black uh, and it's not there. Or it can appear like a slight shadow of light. So I realized that even open vision got different frequencies. And that was an interesting thing. I, I love to talk more uh, about experiences and my analysis of experiences based on the Bible. And um, uh, when we have time and, and when your question and answers are in the area. Uh, but I have analyzed a lot. You know I'm a thinking person. And, uh, and as far as what Colin says, I'm a chess player. Uh, since I'm born again and since I went to ministry, I've never needed to use my skills as a chess player to uh, manage my life. Never. I've uh, surrendered that all to the Lord. And uh, to me, uh, you operate in the spiritual, it's a lot of mercy, forgiveness, and uh, you, you don't use those skills. Those are more subconscious. And perhaps uh, the best training in chess is uh, visualization, where uh, you could visualize, uh, a good player will visualize his 16 moves. No, we couldn't see under 64 moves or 100 moves. No, we only estimate. We can see like um, when you're playing chess, you can visualize what the pawn uh, formation is like, uh, how I want the end game will be like with different pawn formation. I create the pawn formation by destroying and, and, and playing 
or, or what kind of pieces I will end up with. And uh, if I don't want a draw, I will make sure we don't have opposing bishops. Like, you know, the bishop can be on the white square or black square. Opposing bishops tend to draw. So I avoid that if I, I know it's a play to win game. And um, so you know certain chess rules. But basically, the best training in chess, which I always encourage uh, you know, the children to learn, is visualization. You learn to visualize eight moves at first, four moves and eight moves. Then a good player can visualize 16 moves. Plus, you can estimate what kind of pieces will be left behind uh, and what kind of pawn formation will be left behind and where your king will be placed with a few pieces. Because in chess, there is the opening game, the middle game, and the ending. So you need to memorize a lot of opening games. So you play very fast because when you have uh, you when you analyze all the openings, whether it's French defense, Sicilian defense, or uh, the Royal Lopez and uh, Queen's Gambit, etc., and you memorize all the openings, you probably know the first sixteen moves or twenty one moves uh, of an opening game. So it's just automatic. Then you go to the middle game, which you got to think through. And then you need to visualize the end game. So the best things I've learned from chess is not uh, uh, not so much uh, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, anticipating people because uh, it's too much in life to think about those things. And um, uh, it's just an enjoyment of the game. And then um, uh, uh, that visualizing state, it's uh, like a training of your soul and a part training of your spirit. And you inherit that visualization capacity to see and visualize uh, the end product of any decision you make. And uh, so I would say that even though I, uh, I have uh, uh, chess skills and all that, I do not use chess skills when you do God's work. What I use is I obey the visions God showed me and I listen. I listen to God. I can hear God every day. I hear God. Every day God speaks. Every day I have downloads. Every day. And I don't go a day without downloads. And I enjoy this open relationship with God. And um, the best thing about the ministry and working with God is God speaks. God speaks. And right now, I'm also obeying God. And I, I'm, I'm on a um, prayer walk, altar building trip. And uh, I'm obeying God because this is what God told me to do. And uh, I hear God's voice and I know this God's instruction. And the thing about me is, if God says something, that's it. I'm, I'm just a born servant to obey. And that's what, uh, how I carry out my things. And so sometimes people think they know me, but they don't know me. And they think they have understood uh, no, just like I, I think human beings are like that. Um, you can understand probably if you know a person very well, 80, 90 percent, but there's always a certain percentage that you cannot. And I know why also, because, you know, I analyze everything. It's because if you don't have the same experience or you don't have a similar type of uh, uh, things that you go through, there are certain parts you can never fully understand. So, you know, if if you have never walked with only 10 cents coin or 50 cents coin, and that's all the money you have in the world, you won't know what it's like to live by faith. Once I've gone through that stage, I'm not afraid of even without any money. Because you know, I can survive on God's love, green grass, and you can find food along the way. And uh, it's something that is very toughness in you that a person who had never gone through that would not know. And I know what it's like to take a bus knowing you've got no money to return, just to preach the word of God. This kind of experience establishes you as a person who learned to trust God. And I know what it was like. And um, so uh, you learn to hear God. You learn to obey God. And um, 
And one of the most um, uh, difficult things was when uh, God was processing a healing and uh, you can't experience it fully yet, but you by faith know you have received like Kenneth again, and you push yourself through to the manifestation of the healing. So there's no way you can understand 100%, 100% because you don't have the same experience. A person can talk about it, but it's different when you experience it. I mean, it's like uh, you're placed on an island with no money. And Jesus did that to them. Jesus, when he sent them the first time two by two out, he told them, don't bring your wallet, don't bring your purse, don't bring any money. You have to go and live by faith. That means you go to a certain town. Uh, if you're successful with the gospel, you enjoy the hospitality of the house that opens to you and preach the gospel, then move on. He wanted them to live by faith. Now, one fine day, the future, and not now, after training everyone, I will be training millions of five-fold ministers. And um, uh, after training them, uh, there will be one, a time when God will send them out without any money. He just walk by the power of God, two by two. He will come, the day will come. But it's sometime quite a distance in the future. And the other thing is that uh, through over 40 years of ministry, I've experienced all the 12 gifts of the Spirit at different times. And I would say that I know why God uh, trained me so hard. is so that I can help everyone to experience different of the 12 gifts of the Spirit, uh, of the nine gifts of the Spirit uh, that God gave to you. So whatever gift level you have, uh, with tutoring and with Bible training, I would be able to help you to reach the fullness. Whether it be any of the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, um, which is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and uh, discerning of spirits, uh, uh, the gift of tongues, uh, gift of interpretation of tongues, the gift of prophecy. And, uh, it could also be uh, in the power gifts, the working of miracles, the gifts of healing, or so the gift of faith. I could describe and help uh, each one of you whatever gifts. Now, we cannot give you the gifts because gifts come from God. But whatever gifts God gave to you, you would be able to experience it. And I realized that open vision is just one of the nine gifts. It's called discerning of spirit. So uh, Kenneth Hagin, at a certain point in his life, had that in, uh, in his life. And I realized that having an open vision does not protect you from being deceived. And it does not protect you from uh, wrong conclusions, wrong interpretations. And may I remind you again, at the very beginning of this move, when the prophet was sent to work alongside me, the Lord revealed to him that there is a right side he cannot see. He can only see the left side. And the right side got a lot of misinterpretation, wrong things and wrong things inside. And, um, and uh, when I analyzed the past downloads and all that, I realized he was supposed to be trained uh, for three years before he's fully released. And uh, part of it, you know, I always accept my responsibility on my part is because uh, I keep you know, rejecting the prophetic call myself. Uh, if they accepted that I was also a prophet and can train them, it would have been a better uh, perspective. But yet, each person's failure is their own responsibility. Yeah. But I realized that uh, after you know, prophets come and go, uh, I realized that we need to pray, train good prophets. And if they learn how to operate with the uh, other part of being mighty in scriptures, they could last longer and be used greatly by God. And um, so they won't step out of their bounds. And that can happen to any ministry. It could be a, a teacher who began to be big-headed and think they're only one who teach like they can teach. Uh, it could be an evangelist who experience a lot of miracles and think they're greater than everybody else. You know, just like it can be a prophet who think they're the only one who can hear God. 
and uh, or an apostle who after they plant a few mega church, their head get big and they think that they're so powerful uh, just because you've got a, a mega church behind you. Uh, or it could be, you know, it was a simple pastor who's successful and popular and well-loved by people. Anyone can become proud and uh, be rejected by God. And so we all need to walk with humility in the Lord and not walk outside our domain and understand that. And basically, you know, I, I'm glad for this move. And, and those of you who know me, you know my nature and I'm a very simple person. I enjoy simple things. Um, but when it comes to authority spiritually, authority of the Bible, I know the God that I serve. I hear. And uh, so once in a while, spiritual authority gets challenged and it's sad. And um, I know how to put a prophet in their place. I know how to put a person in their place. But I myself recognize that I need to work with other humans, which I'm glad we have a sort of board that we can talk about, you know, good friends and colleagues in the Lord. And those of you that work closely with, you know, how uh, I never use spiritual things to lord it over you. I always say, you know, let's uh, speak on an equal basis. Do you hear the Lord? Do you hear the Lord? What did the Lord say? And, um, uh, but like Paul, when he wrote his when he wrote his epistles, he says he's an apostle called by God and not by man. He know where he stands, and um, so it's important. And I have to make that clarification, and also talk about my own uh, failures. Where uh, I think my main failure was I did not accept that I was a prophet, and um, as a result. Um, uh, the Lord hear my words of confession and did not uh, 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 work with me in this manner because God cannot force you to do what you yourself do not accept. But in this end time move, I was surprised by the fact I was already very happy with being like Paul and uh, having the three, four, three or the five four ministries. And then in this end time, God says, you have to stay in all fivefold to be like Jesus. I said, whoa. You know, to be one is really wonderful. To be five. And also because I know the price you have to pay. And the amount of time you have to spend with God to do all five. And I discover why. Because I have to train other fivefold ministries. The best way to train them is to be that ministry too. So if you're not a teacher, you cannot train other teachers. If you're not a apostle, you cannot train other apostles. You're not a prophet, you cannot train other prophets. We need millions of fivefold ministries in this end time to be trained and sent forth. So I believe God knows best and God knows uh, uh, how to raise different people. Although sometimes we might disagree with the leaders that God raised uh, and I'm sure... A lot of people out there who say, oh God, not him. Why don't you use somebody else? I'm sure there will be people like that. And like I say, I'm sorry, God just chose me and I'm just doing my best here to do a good job for God uh, for the end time church. And uh, anyway, here we are. And I'm glad that each one of you continue strong in the Lord and love the Lord. And uh, they are, as I say, uh, gifts that come from God that human beings cannot give to you. You have to receive it from God. I cannot make you an apostle. A cathedral of glory cannot make you an apostle or prophet. No organization can do that. No human being can do that. Whether you're apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, is a call from God himself. But if you're called by God to any ministry, we can help to train you. 100%, I know we can help to train you to be the calling that God wants you to be. And the same with the 12 gifts, uh, the, with, uh, I always say 12 gifts. Uh, actually, in my book, in the foundation series, I talk about 12, uh, what I call administrative or ministry gifts, and among them is administration and um, give our helps and all the others, which we can also train 
And I wrote about them in the foundational truth series about the various gifts of the Spirit. And then there is the nine manifestation, which is found in 1 Corinthians 12. And that we can help train you. We cannot give you the gifts. The gifts come from the Holy Spirit. But once you have the gift, we can train you. I have illustrated many times how uh, the operation of the gift of tongues, uh, I could expand it into many areas because uh, I, uh, I love the gifts of spirit and I love to experiment with different areas of the gifts of the spirit and learn to operate them. And uh, like some of my descriptions, so you know that I'm talking for experience, I talk about uh, interpretation of tongues, the gift of tongues, how it operate. I talk about the word of knowledge. When I saw Catherine Kuhlman operate the word of knowledge, I wanted to know how. Then God taught me how. And then uh, I realized that you can receive a manifestation. Then after a manifestation, you can also, it's like a radio signal, but spiritual signal, sometimes it's stronger in one direction than another. So that tells you the direction of where uh, you're getting the signal of healing coming from. And also sometimes a company with a vision and I can see the exact person and describe the clothes they're wearing. And so it's an interesting operation of uh, different giftings. Uh, we can help. We cannot give the gifts, but we will set up a Bible school uh, in the near future where we'll train millions of five four ministries and send them out. The good thing is this time God is going to supply more than sufficient finances. And so uh, Petrido of Glory and Johan Ministries will be probably employing uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people food. But we can send them all over the world to uh, perfect the body of Christ and also to establish a 24-hour uh, praise and worship in all the 24 segments of uh, of the world, so that every hour there's one section of the planet. While David have to organize it in one city, in one country, uh, we have the responsibility with the key of David given to us to operate on the planet, planetary scale. And so Moses has to exodus uh, one nation. We have to exodus many nations uh, before the sh great shaking that takes place uh, in 2029, which God has given uh, exact dates. So we do have a great responsibility. We're walking step by step with God. We know where we're heading and we are patiently waiting upon God, just enjoying fellowship with God. And like I say, you don't have to have open visions, although open visions would be at a different category, uh, in order to receive greatness. Me, Vigas would never have open vision. But he worked with two angels. And it's very powerful. He can hear God and he just obey God. And towards the end of his ministry, his hearing was sharp. And I know Elijah in the Bible. Elijah in the Bible, his hearing was greater than his seeing, although he saw vision. But he could be speaking to the king and the angel speak something, he knew what the angel was talking to him. He distinguished the voices of the angels that he worked with. Catherine Kuhlman does not have open visions. In fact, uh, her ability to teach is much lesser than uh, Kenneth Hagin. But yet, the amount of miracles that she performed as an evangelist called by God, is much greater than you could see even in Kenneth Higgins' ministry. When she died suddenly, Higgins was asked to take over one of her meetings. And Higgins himself confessed, I, I'm not um, uh, operating uh, at this level of the working in miracles, so I will just do my job as a prophet and as a teacher and then pray for the people. He does have some miracles, but not to the extent of Catherine Kuhlman. So understand that having one or two gifts of the Spirit does not make you special. Everyone is special in God. The word peculiar in the Bible in the Old King James means special. God makes every one of us special. So please, don't think of yourself above others. 
If you're aware of your uniqueness, just remember you're unique because you could be the eye has to be different from the finger. And you're operating at that level. And there's no way the eye can do what the finger do. Because the eye can see the food but cannot reach out for the food. So every gift, every calling have their own advantages, uniqueness, and their limitations. Once we recognize the limitations of each one of us, not weaknesses, limitations, is so that we can all function as a body of Christ together and achieve harmony and achieve the works of Jesus in a way that Jesus meant it to be achieved. But here's where I say that there are giftings that can change you. Uh, the character that I have now is not what I was uh, as a person before I was born again. I was introvert. I was a chess player, was introvert. Uh, I don't mind being alone. I'm not very sociable as a person. And uh, I, as long as I have a book to read, I don't care about everything else. I could be a lone ranger without Tonto. And I'm happy. I'm happy with my isolated life uh, that I can enjoy. Uh, but then that character has to change. And through the years, as God called me to ministry, I learned to develop social skills. I learned to be more hospitable and more of a conversationalist where I can conduct a conversation and uh, I could uh, talk um, um, uh, uh, fellowship better and uh, make a person feel uh, welcome so that, in fact, now during some of the prayer walks, some of you notice that while people quit in groups, uh, I distribute myself to everyone else and I will go from table to table while people are enjoying their dinner or lunch and just sit here and sit there so that I could fellowship with different people who come from different countries to do prayer walk. And I will still keep doing that. Those skills, I don't have before I was called. And those skills uh, just slowly came as I learned to become a pastor. And I began to notice who got no one to talk to and I would sit with them. Things I wouldn't notice before, but it comes second nature now. And so God can change your character. God can give you uh, uh, abilities to suit your calling, even if you are the very opposite of what uh, you're supposed to be. And I believe prophets can be trained to be more sociable and not so dictatorial. And same with apostles. Some apostles are also dictatorial train them to be more democratic, even though you have the power to appoint. And so these are all the things. But I found something interesting. Sometimes you don't have to be right at the top to know your calling to be proud. Sometimes people just at whatever level also become proud. So I'm quite surprised. You know, what? Just this thing also you can want to become proud. And so I realized pride happens to everyone that they have to deal with pride uh, uh, wherever they are. And all of us have to learn to die to self, to allow Christ to live within us. Well, the first point I'm speaking about is there are these uh, five-four offices, gifts, there are these uh, First Corinthians 12, nine gifts of the Spirit, and there are these uh, Romans 12 giftings or administrations, gifts of help and uh, gift of giving and many other of these gifts that I identify in my foundation you know, book series on the gifts of the Spirit. And these are all paid for by Jesus. You don't have to struggle to receive them. You don't have to qualify yourself to receive them. They are yours because God has predestined you to manifest certain gifts. And when we are in a fivefold ministry, God will give you the nine gifts of the Spirit in different combinations to qualify you for your fivefold offices. Paul mentioned the signs of an apostle. 
And so we realize that apostles need our gifts to back up their ministry. And a prophet need revelation gifts to back up their ministry. The pastoral gift most likely need tons of interpretation to back up their calling and to be a, an expert in those areas of the vocal gifts. So each of the fivefold and each of the gifting are all free. They are by the grace of God. The word gift itself is from the word charisma, um, which means uh, it's like gracelets, uh, drops of grace given to each one of us to make us more like Jesus. So in the first big general point, we can be like Jesus through what he paid the price for us. And when, and some of you who have not experienced it, when the gifts of God come into your life, it can change the personality. It can, can change and transform the kind of person you were into somebody that you might not realize you could be. When the Holy Spirit came upon King Saul to make him king, the prophet Samuel told him, you will be turned into another man. And the scripture for that in the Old Testament, and let me give it to you, to tell you that the gifts of the Spirit, whether the nine gifts or the Roman 12, 12 gifts, or the uh, Ephesians 4, 5 uh, of, uh, offices of the Spirit of God, they can change your personality. The more you yield to the gifts, it changes your personality. Like I told you before, I'm not a very sociable, sociable guy. And uh, I could sit in a room for five hours where everybody's fellowshipping and just read a book or be thinking to myself between takes. But that is not a very good pastor if, if a pastor does that. That is a, not a very good minister especially when he's supposed to help bless and strengthen and encourage people. And so my personality got changed by the gifting and the calling of God. I was very introvert. I would say now I'm balanced both in extrovert and introvert. And um, God can change you uh, through the giftings of God. So this is what is said about um, King Saul before he was a king. And so here, let me get where Samuel was talking to him for the first time. In the book of First Samuel, when um, he was told uh, uh, what he can become in the anointing that he received in First Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander of his inheritance? And so he anointed him. You know, at that time, the future was so bright for everyone. No one knew that Saul would become such a bad king. Uh, as, as usual, all the hopes are there. and All the giftings of God are there. The same when I work with people. You notice that uh, it is I that welcome people. I could make a choice not to. A lot of churches are not welcoming. Even when I was operating mega churches, I was always welcoming different ministries because I realized it takes all fivefold to help everyone. And then there are also different types of fivefold. I love the body of Christ for my congregation to be blessed. And so uh, even in Singapore, well, I was the apostle who started the church, you know, no matter how small it was. And it was my authority to welcome a prophet or not. And uh, every church, most of the time, reject prophets. They also reject evangelists. All they want are other cell leaders to help their church grow. So they are very selfish. I'm not a selfish person when I'm in charge of a church. I help, help establish other ministries, give them a place in a church. Do you know why many pastors don't do that? They're afraid that uh, the other people might steal their glory. For me, I'm not, I'm not insecure at all. I don't care how great you can do things. I have my own calling. I am established and I know who I am. And uh, so 
you know, I will give place to people who have uh, calling for apostles to plant more churches, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Some of them, I realize in the future that will happen even more. Some of them will have colorful characters, and uh, and uh, some of them will have uh, uh, charismatic uh, uh, personalities, uh, more charismatic uh, than even myself. But I don't care. As long as you're good ministry, I will help you and let's perfect the body of Christ. And as long as nobody becomes too proud or they try to uh, uh, sort of uh, remove me and then try to replace me, and uh, only God can be the one who do that. And so uh, even when our church was small in Singapore, it was my decision together with the board whom I will consult to welcome a prophet in. But usually, when it's a good thing, most of the council would flow along, and the final authority always gives to the person who is uh, running the whole uh, church in spiritual authority. And I welcome, I welcome people to do that. And, uh, but I have experienced over and over and over again how sometimes some of them, when they begin to grow, become comfortable. Uh, number one, they are become ungrateful for the place given to them in the organized church. And um, number two, some of them think they are better than you. And that's where their failure is. I mean, uh, only God can see all things, right? And uh, if really there is something uh, that God knows, uh, God would, would have, uh, be the one who put any whosoever is in charge. But so, number two, some of them begin to think they're better than you. And um, they think they know more than you. And so, you know, sometimes I always try to put them down and say, well, if you know more, you will be in my place and I will be in your place. It won't be the opposite. And uh, even in the business world, I'm sure some uh, people might have experienced it, that uh, in the business world, uh, uh, after a while, another person in the organization think they can do better than the CEO or uh, better than the manager above them and on to uh, uh, do a mini coup d'etat or coup d uh, uh, to replace them. And so those things happen also in the business world. People play politics. This is a political game that Jesus doesn't play. And um, I was having fellowship uh, with uh, various individuals. And then I also told some in the USA, some people don't really know Jesus. If you, if you know the real Jesus and you watch from the Bible, I read this gospel thousands of times and I also fellowship with Jesus in the spiritual dimension. You don't know Jesus. How tricky he is in certain things. And remember when the uh, uh, when uh, a person came to Jesus and said, uh, and he was deprived of his inheritance, and this is a true case, and said, Jesus, tell my brother to share his inheritance with me. Jesus didn't even get involved. Jesus just began to speak about beware of covetousness. Didn't even help him. Didn't even empathize with his position that he's been deprived. He just speak about, you know, how these worldly things should not affect a person. And if you were there, you might be hurt. If you were the person who asked Jesus to empathize with you, you might be hurt. And many people think that Jesus show uh, empathy at all times. There are some times when Jesus cannot stand worldliness and he speaks very strongly against it. And so when it occurs at the wrong time, you might get hurt. Remember how Mary and the brothers were trying to get Jesus' attention while he was in the midst of ministry. Jesus put them down. Uh, if they are not spiritual enough to understand Jesus, they might get hurt. I mean, personal feelings and emotional feelings. And I know a lot of you, if you actually live and eat with Jesus for three years, you might be hurt by Jesus. Because Jesus is not the person you think he is. You misconstrue who Jesus is. You paint a picture of Jesus of not the true Jesus, the Jesus you want. But 24 hours a, a day, you call upon him and say, Yes, 
What do you want? Oh yeah, I love you. Is this the picture of Jesus who walked on the earth for three years in the ministry? 33 years? No. There are some times when Jesus is in a certain position and he just tells you all. And you're stunned. Oh, Jesus can scold me. I thought Jesus never scold. The version of Jesus I have never scold anyone. But Jesus rebuked his disciples many times and said, when he says in the boat, Beware of the fat of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees then say, Why? Are we lacking bread? You see how silly of them? They think about carnal bread. As if the Pharisees open bread shop and Jesus say, Don't buy bread from them. No, Jesus was speaking spiritually. And then when they didn't understand, Jesus quoted them. Jesus says, uh, you know. I've been so long with you, you still don't understand what I'm talking. I'm not talking about leaven in the bread. I'm talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Watch out for them. And he says, you know, are you still afraid not enough bread? In the feeding of the 5,000, how many loaves are left? And they told, in the feeding of the 4,000, how many loaves are left? Well, they got a rebuke from Jesus. If you stay 24 hours with Jesus, I can guarantee you there are some times you might get hurt, but it's your fault, not Jesus' fault. Because Jesus is perfect. You can't blame Jesus. So some of you who are listening to this word have a wrong impression of Jesus. The Jesus you painted is your version of Jesus. The true Jesus it's very much like Smith Vigor's word, like uh, Lester Sunrell, or perhaps uh, like me, who sometimes strong and might hurt you because you're talking nonsense. Or, you know, easy to misunderstand. Why do you think Judas Iscariot dare to betray Jesus? Because he put Jesus in a box. He was hurt when Jesus did not do something about the woman who spent so much money on this perfume. And then he said, oh, this perfume, probably one whole year or several years of salary, this woman spent. Shouldn't the money be given to the poor? What clever to argue logic. But in his heart, he was covetous for the money. And Jesus says, this woman did what she did. As a, this is my words, as a prophetic act for what is to happen. And God is allowing this. And then Jesus said, you always have the poor. We're always helping the poor. But just this once, let me have this because it's pointing to what is to come. And Judas got hurt. And from that day onwards, he sought to betray Jesus. So the version of Jesus you have might be an impractical Jesus. Come on. Three years you don't think they get a scolding? Three years with Jesus you don't think they get a rebuke or correction? And sometimes Jesus do things, don't tell them. Because sometimes Jesus speaks in parables. And then when they came to Jesus in John 4, Jesus says, I have food to eat or we should do not all. Then they asked around, food, Napao? He sent us to get food. Now we bring food. He don't want food. I don't like this master. See? I can give you many Bible incidences where over three years, they get rebuked, they get scolded, but of course, Jesus never lost his temper. But I can tell you, when you work with anyone, 24 hours a day, or stay under the same roof, there will be rules, there will be things that you don't cross a line. And you cross a line, Jesus himself will scold you. So don't paint a version of Jesus that is your own. 
be humble and accept the in true reality of life, day to day, you might get scolded because you make mistakes. It's part of a human condition. We are not in heaven. Like heaven is a bit different. When in heaven, you can transmit things by thoughts and your perfect understanding. But on earth, where people cannot understand everything, Sometimes Jesus doesn't explain everything because the, the apostles are too dull to understand. Or sometimes he don't explain because he wants to test them. Remember in the feeding of the 5,000, he asked Philip, Philip, since you suggested that he uh, talk about these people's need, uh, why don't you feed them? And then Philip calculated, of course, they don't have a calculator. He calculates his mind. Or if they have this uh, baskets or whatever. <laughs> you see, even if we have that much money, we cannot buy enough bread for these people. Plus, I don't know where to get a bread. So Jesus allow certain situations, puzzle them, for them to learn something. We learn through experience. So don't whitewash your own version of Jesus. Accept that in this life, the way God used different men and women of God is the way God needs them. You need a, a, a military man who is trained in military strategy and organization like Moses to lead the exodus of his time. Without the discipline that he has, he cannot lead 3 million people out. And you need a creative thinker like Joshua, who is a, a trainee under Moses, to lead the battle to fight for the land of Canaan. And from the early days, even before they reached the land of Canaan, he was the one Moses always asked to lead the, the campaign, to fight the war. Although Moses himself is a military man who knows how to fight. The Bible tells us that uh, he was strong in word and deed. And uh, Josephus write about his military campaigns in Ethiopia. He was a brilliant military commander. But he led Joshua experience. See, part of our thing. Sometimes experience is necessary to train a person. Because Joshua is going to be the one who lead the campaign after Moses finishes ministry. You need a strong personality uh, like uh, Elijah to confront the darkness of his time and the most wicked king and queen that exists in all of Israel, Ahab and Jezebel. And Elijah was a no-nonsense, no-joke kind of person. If you were under Elijah, like Elisha, some of you might not survive for 10 years. Elisha did. So sometimes we whitewash things, you know, and we put personalities into Jesus or other men of God without realizing that in real life, these are the people who you might find very hard to work with. But God is wise. He chooses different people for different things. He knows what kind of character is needed. Like for Apostle Paul. I think Apostle Paul was a much more strict character than Apostle Peter. Apostle Paul was a no-nonsense person. You can tell from the way he argued with Barnabas about Mark. But you need a character like Apostle Paul to carry the burden and the work that is necessary. God used different people at different times. Sometimes God needs a lion, so God needs a lion-like person. Sometimes God needs a donkey, so he got a donkey-like person. Different characters, different people to hold the cause steady 
to do God's work in God's time. And when we're under different people, sometimes we wish they are like other people. You know, you could be under a lion. And then, uh, then you say, oh, I wish a lion was more like a sheep. But if it was a sheep, you know, the person, the, 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 the area of authority, the person is in charge, will long ago be eaten up and conquered by other lions. So God raised a lion there and you happen to work under that lion. God knows. And the personality is not there to just socialize. We are here to do a job. We do our best being pastoral. But sometimes we don't have enough time to what I call play play. We got more time and we need to pray pray. So God use different personalities for different things. And you can be sure God does not make mistakes. When you choose different people, even yourself, for doing different things, God does not make mistakes. He knows your DNA. He knows your capacity. He knows your strength and weakness. And He chose you. So remember, each one of you are special. And there are some things that are that that you are not who you are yet, and God has to put His gift into you to change you. Just like He changed King Saul, but King Saul actually refused to keep the change. That was a problem. King Saul has insecurity, and you can remem remember in the on the day of inauguration, even after he's anointed, he's still hiding. And he's still very negative about himself. He still put himself down. And he always say, you know, oh, you know, uh, my father is a nobody. I'm a nobody. And that worked against him. He was not a nobody. He was pretty well off. Not everybody has donkeys, own donkeys, and is looking for his lost donkeys. But here, after the prophecy, that's him what will happen. And then he says in verse 6, we're in uh, 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, how the gift of God can change your personality. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. You say, I don't know, I didn't know the Spirit of God can turn me into another man. Then if he wanted to turn me into another man, why didn't he choose someone with a characteristic? Let's say for myself. I will not succeed if I'm an introvert. I have to be more extrovert and proactive. But I was willing to change. I was willing to let God change me, do whatever He wants me to be. I had to be proactive. Uh, to be more pastoral, to encourage people who are shy into the ministry God called them to be. And God changed me. I allow God to change me. If I kept my old personality of being introvert, uh, no social skills, and uh, not caring about people around me, but just thinking only for my own things, I would not succeed in the ministry. I have to be willing to change and realize I need to change. And indeed, God has changed me. I look at my personality now compared to my personality before the Lord called me in ministry. It's like two different things. Saul was not willing to change, to be more kingly, to be more honorable. Because Saul is the one who is quite dishonorable. And you can see how he speaks about his own wife to Jonathan. And um, he has to be more kingly. And he changed. He became a bold person with the Spirit of God. King has to be bold. You don't want to have a cowardly king. A king has to have a lion heart. And God changed him to a bold person. Before that, 
Here's a heart of a mouse. Scary little cat. God has to change him to be lion-hearted. He's bold when the Spirit of God came upon him. But he didn't learn how to allow the Spirit of God to change him into the new personality that he need to have. I know you're going to ask the question, you're going to need boldness. Why not go choose a person bold now? Why choose a cowardly guy? Because God knows only the person who experienced the other side can truly be great at boldness because he knows the other side, what cowardly is. And only a person who knows how to be quiet and don't need anyone for five hours or days. You know, you can, you can put me in a place all by myself for 40 days and 40 nights and I will enjoy myself because I have the Lord. This is my personality that I never lost. I learned to be alone. But of course, you know, now with uh, you know, loved ones, I enjoy having loved ones around. But I never lose the capacity to stand alone. And look, even if all my leaders fail me left, right, center, I still can be alone, still doing the thing. That quality you can never have. That because God chose me from the other side of the picture where I'm used to being alone. I haven't lost that part. But that part is no more a hindrance in my social skill. God changed me and I allow God to change me and I realize I need to raise other leaders because you can never change the world alone by yourself. Even if we say it takes only one Jesus to change the world, that one Jesus need to raise uh, 12 uh, disciples, one faith got 11 plus 70 others plus he appeared to over 500 people and they're all still loyal to Jesus. They've been converted by Jesus. So Jesus knows how to invest in people. And God's gifts can change you to another person. And the reason why is, whatever you have from your personality is an asset. So that when God changes you, God combine what He increased in your life with what you have. Remember one of my teachings. Every character has a balance. The lion and the lamb. You need to experience both to be balanced. The horse and the mule. One too slow, one too fast. You, you know both sides, you're balanced. And there's such a thing that God needs in our soul. So don't hang on to your own uh, idiosyncrasies of your character. Allow the Holy Spirit to change you through His giftings to become another better person. Yes, the gifts can change you. It changed Paul until, do you know, talk about vengeance is the Lord's. Paul was a very action a vengeful person who take revenge for God. And in fact, he said when he, when he uh, imprisoned the Christians and all that, he thought he was serving God. He imprisoned and killed. When, when uh, Stephen was being stoned, Paul was holding all the clothes of the people, encouraging everyone to stone him. Kill him! This is the kind of character Paul is. In the end, Paul became a person that is very uh, kind and uh, always want to spare the life of people opposite from who he was as a natural person. But he had this in him where he would kill the person easily. Think about King David. King David has to kill Goliath to be a hero and he had fought many wars he shed so much blood and God says because you shed so much blood I don't, don't think you're suitable you're more man of war or man of peace. And uh, your son will be a man of peace who does not know any war that I will raise to build a temple. But he can't help being a man of war. You have to fight a war to establish the boundaries of your country so that the other countries don't come and attack you. 
So was God pointing to his uh, weakness as a military uh, general that will wage war? It can't be. Because if David didn't kill, Goliath wouldn't be killed, nor would all the other uh, people who fought with him. He has to kill in order to establish the country against all the others. But yet, his very killing prevented him to be a man of peace. Although he has a peaceful nature, as you know, he, he wanted to settle the civil war with um, the uh, uh, other general and then Joab go and murder uh, the other general out of uh, revenge for his uh, brother who died in the civil war. As a hell, was his name. And uh, Abner was uh, the name of the other general. But David had to fight and shed blood. Solomon did, did not have. And yet God used David to establish a lot of things. And um, in this prophecy about Saul being turned into another man, look at verse 9. In, in 1 Samuel 10, verse 9. So it was, when he turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. So God was doing character changes in Saul. The only thing he did not take, Saul kept going back to his old, old self. He did not allow God to change him. In order to do the works of Jesus and the greater works of Jesus, we must accept all the gifts that Jesus has paid his precious blood for. Whether it be the fivefold gifts, the ministry, fivefold gifts in Ephesians 4, the ministry gifts in uh, Romans 12, the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, we must accept the gift God gave us including all the gift of resurrection life and eternal life and, and authority to become the sons of God. We must receive all those gifts, but not just receive and have them. We must receive those gifts and allow the gifts to change us. You know, Peter, who always uh, was like a horse too fast, and then sometimes when he reacts, he turns the other opposite. And um, in the last test that he had, when he denied Jesus three times, and Jesus healed him in the encounter on the beach, when he asked him three times whether he loved him, Peter became a different person in Acts the 1, the 2, chapter 3, the 4, the 5, the 6. The seven, the eight, the nine, the ten. And then in chapter 10, when he was asked to go to the Gentiles, he was quite concerned about the Jews who were anti-Gentiles. And in Acts 11, he did not say the same way like he say in Acts 2. In Acts 2, when they say, what must we do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord. In Acts 11, he says, Acts 10 and Acts 11, he says, can anyone stop this from being baptized? Suddenly, he don't have so much authority. He asks a question instead of commanding them because of the Jews who were anti-Gentile. He knew that going to the Gentiles would stir up the Jews. I mean, I love the Jewish people today. We are like, they are brothers and sisters and cousins to them. And they indeed, because of them, the gospel came and then came to us Gentiles. We need to honor the Jews and they have suffered enough in the Second World War Holocaust, 
and they deserve our help, no matter how much they seem to be anti Christ, uh, anti Jesus. Uh, sometimes in their strong Judaism, um, one day they come to know Jesus, whom they rejected. And those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem, God bless us. So we do, you know, understand that, but you must understand that when, when they're deep in Judaism, they might hate the Gentiles. And that's just a part of parcel, all religious people, uh, to exclude others and even sometimes, sadly, to hate others. We should not be. Religion should not teach people to hate. It should teach people to be loving. And anyway, Peter was afraid of the Jewish people. That showed in Acts 11. And then the more Jews were saved, the more they want to remain inside the Jewish synagogue. It's just like a lot of Christians who become charismatic and they're attending a non-charismatic church. They just find it very hard to leave the church. And so the same way, they struggle to leave the Judaism. They don't realize that Christianity is a totally different religious movement that cannot live side by side with Judaism. So under Paul, the Gentiles came to be called Christians in Acts 11. It began like something outside the synagogue. And Paul was called to them. But you notice, through time in Acts 15, the question of the Gentiles was so prominent, staring them in the face, even to the extent before Acts 15 that when Peter visited the Gentile church, Paul mentioned Galatians, that when Jews came in, he is an apostle was so frightened and quickly go to a different table to eat. And Paul rebuked them. Paul is not afraid to be ostracized. He's not afraid to be rejected. And he said, when you do this, and he stands strong. In Acts 15, despite his uh, meanderings, Peter stood with Paul. And they have a final meeting to say the Gentiles can be Christians without being part of Judaism. That was a breakthrough. Thank God they all listened to the Spirit. But it did show the bold Peter was now a bit of his old self on his day. Like when he withdraw to eat with the even the Jews instead of the Gentiles and Jewish people came. That original covertly part. And through time, of course, I'm sure he successfully finished the apost apostolic ministry. He went to Rome and uh, became a leader over there in the church there. But we can see a little bit of almost meandering before he, he pulled his socks up and became the apostle God wants him to be. Thank God. He could have failed. It is important for us to see that the gifts and callings of God must be received to the level where we allow them to establish new characteristics that we like. And we can become who Jesus wants us to do and be, and then we can do the works of Jesus. Now I'm going to point two. Things that are not grace and gift, things that we need to experience to become like Jesus. You can see in the book of First John, uh, John chapter 1, John chapter 1 of 1st John. In John chapter 1, as began to describe Jesus, 
John also bear witness, John the Baptist bore witness of him and said, we know in verse 14 who Jesus actually was. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I say, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And this is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. Verse 16. Of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came to Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So the reason why Jesus is who He is, is because Jesus can see the glory of God in ways that no one can see. And then there's this law that says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, that we will be transformed according to the glory we see. It says in verse 18, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It states here you can only become what you see. So if you see 50 thousand voltage you can transform to fifty thousand voltage if you see hundred thousand voltage of glory you can become hundred thousand voltage basically that's what it says if you see jesus in his fullness you can become jesus in fullness now how does that apply to the fact here that we have to do the works of jesus obviously we must be exactly like him which is what we emphasize on the last teaching in order to do the same works that Jesus did. And since Jesus see to such a high level of glory as the begotten of the Father, we must see the same level of glory in order to become like Him and do the works He did. Reasonable argument. So if we don't reach that level of what He can see, how can we do the works that He did? The question is, can this be a gift? Or can we desire and grow to the same experience? It is not quite a gift. It's not like Jesus gave you the gift to see. It's more like Jesus opened a door for us to grow. Because in the book of John 17, John 17, Jesus prayed for us. And Jesus described what true eternal life is. And say, eternal life is to know God. It says in verse 3. And then he says that he has given us his word, yes. But here he says in verse 5, now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. That was when he was the only begotten of the Father. And then he began to pray for us. Not for the world, but he prayed for us. And in his prayer, he says here, about what he desires of us. In verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. This is not a gift. This is his desire for us. Remember, Jesus prayed for Judas, his carry didn't work. Jesus prayed for Peter, it worked. Now he's praying for us. In verse 21, you, Father, are in me and I in you, that you also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you give me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. So he does reveal that glory. 
And then verse 24, Father, I desire, not a gift, I desire that they also whom you give me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. So it is Jesus' desire that we experience in him the glory that he can see, we can see, we can be transformed. Now you might say this is a gift. I don't think so. This is a desire that he prayed for us. It is just like Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 to 14 says that every Israelite will never be sick. And it's also found in Exodus 15, 26, when God says he is Jehovah uh, Rapha, the God who heals them. He said, I will take all this sickness that is in Egypt and I will take them away from you. But there are still people sick in Israel. There are still people poor when God says he's going to bless them. Because God knows human beings. We just said today. How many times have you heard in my preaching, don't be worldly, don't be covetous, don't be like the world. And yet there are people still want to be like the world. And there are many churches that are still teaching people and emphasizing success in the world instead of success in righteousness and God. And of course, success in righteousness and God will bring success in the world, but it's a very different method. You don't have to be worldly to rule the world. You don't have to be worldly to handle all the wealth of the world. In fact, you have to be opposite, unworldly. But from the platforms of many churches, today on Sunday, they're teaching them natural success. I know I experienced it myself during my probation period. I was attending Assemblies of God Church. From the pulpit, the person was preaching and that one Sunday I was very frustrated because he never even quote the Bible. He's teaching from a book and it was a success book. No doubt the points inside are, are reasonably biblical and good points but there was no scripture. And I said, well today I go to church I never even hear one scripture. Because the world has crept into the church and the church is more concerned about natural success. And Christians are more concerned about natural success and so afraid that they will lack success and money that they rather learn the things of the world so they don't be left out. When the promise of God is if you will seek God and His kingdom first, all this will be added to you. When the Bible shows so many stories of people who separate themselves from the world, Abraham, Daniel, Moses, Joshua, who can succeed in this life. And this is not enough to motivate them to love God. Every lover of God in the Bible has been blessed financially, spiritually, and naturally. So why are people afraid of giving up the world? Because there's not enough good teaching. And people are afraid that they will fail if they become holy men and women of God. They are afraid if they emphasize on the spiritual, they will lose out in the natural and in financial areas. Oh, people need to know that when you are close to God, God is the true controller of all the wealth of the world. And He can bless you as a king in Him, more than kings and presidents on this earth. So here, Jesus promised and desire that we can see the Father's glory as He has. But how many people 
desire that? How many Christians desire that? Even the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, I has not seen, nor yet heard the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Yet, why do so many Christians don't love God more? The Bible says there are secret things God prepared for you if you love Him. Why don't people love God? God loves us all equally. But why do we love God inequally? Why do some of us love God more and some love God less? Children, we, knowing what Jesus has done for us and paid such a horrifying eternal price make us fall in love with him to love him with first love yes we should but that is something God must allow us to desire shouldn't Judas is carried being so close to Jesus know who he is and love and treasure this master who forgive him over and over and over again. He should, but he didn't. Whereas Peter appreciated the forgiveness of Jesus when he denied him. In the same way, this is up to us. And I'm going to tell you as it is. Even though I teach that we all can do the works of Jesus, sadly, not everyone might do the works of Jesus and the greater works of Jesus because we don't have the same zeal, passion, and desire to press through. Some of us will. I think all of you in this first batch do. That's my desire. I pray that we will have of the six billion souls saved, 100 million of us will love God in ways that other generations of believers including the Old Testament and the early church, have not been able to do. I pray that at least there will be a hundred million, if possible, a billion of us in six billion. But to the extent they are willing to give everything up, yes, to love him more. If something hinders our love for God, we will give it up. But that is something I cannot force you. Jesus cannot force you. You must give that up. You get more time for Jesus on your own. Now you know why. When they come to point two, in point two A, we need to see the same glory that Jesus saw to transform us to be as He is, to do the same works that He did. And in point to be. We look here again in um, John, and this time John chapter 3. Jesus says in verse 27, I know Jesus, John the Baptist say about Jesus, 
John chapter 3, verse 27. Man can receive nothing unless they've been given to him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I say I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has a bride is a bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is increased, is fulfilled. We must increase, I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony is certified that God is true. For him whom God has sent, speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son, has given him all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What is John speaking about? Firstly, he speaks about Jesus receiving the Spirit without measure. And sometimes, that's all that people get. But if you read carefully, he is also saying that the bride will receive the Spirit without measure. Read carefully. Although we receive the Spirit in measures as we grow, there is a place here if you read carefully. He says, the bride is with the bridegroom. He's talking about the story of the bride. And John regards himself as a friend of the bride, a friend of the bridegroom. The way it's written is that the bridegroom and the bride are equal and at the different level from John. Then he says, He who comes from heaven is above all. Did Jesus want us to also be heavenly? Remember 1 Corinthians 15. The first man is of dust and dies and goes back to dust. The second man and the last Adam is from heaven and became a life-giving spirit, implying we have to be of the heavenly man. We are like God to come from above. Then he says, He whom God has sent, speak the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. That's the full Greek word. He received the Spirit without measure. I know that in reality, according to Romans 12, we receive a measure of faith. But a measure of faith is different from measureless Spirit. Since the day of Pentecost, It has been the unspoken will of God that the Spirit comes without measure. When you read the prophecy, all the Old Testament has measure. But when the Spirit comes, He 
pours His Spirit. It's called the outpouring. It is the will of God that the bride of Jesus Christ, whom Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. The word, as the Father says, I send you, is the same measure. And I will conclude point to BS. We have the potential to receive as we grow in Christ, to receive the Spirit without measure. That's why it's under second point. The gift starts us off. But there's a second part called experience. And even Ephesians 4 point to the measureless part. As we all reach, the gifts are just the beginning, not the end. Why do we always make the beginning the end when the beginning is the beginning and the end is the end? You know, sometimes we compose a song, the beginning of the song is different from the ending. The ending has everything. So when God composed the song of the ages, the bride of Christ and who we are to become, the ending is more powerful than the beginning. The latter reign is greater than the former reign. In verse 11 and 12, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip Equip the church to bring something into the church for what purpose? In verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure, the measurement, to the equivalent measurement of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There you have it. Today, I show to you that ever since the day of Pentecost, God has desired that there be a man or woman who represents Christ or collectively us together represent Christ to have the Spirit without measure. Now it's up to us to pursue that. That is a promise given to us. You can also argue theologically from the bridegroom and the bride. Does not the bride receive everything from the bridegroom? But we call the heirs and joint heirs. You know the title about us. Right, the scriptures that say we are as and join as with Christ. Now, if we are air and join as with Christ, can you be an air and join as with Christ and receive anything less? Theologically, cannot. It has to be equal at the minimum. So, if Jesus has a spirit without measure, the potential for you and I. Is to have the same. Like I say, at first I tremble when I realize that in the end time I have to enter all five full ministries, not just three. And then I realize the vision that God has for the end times is beyond anything that any minister, man or woman of God has ever seen possible for the end time church. Our best theologians could not conceive of what the end time can be like. The best among us of our forefathers of faith could not conceive what we can become in the end time. Finally, the end time move has come. And finally, we can see clearly. We can be exactly like 
Jesus. Oh, what a revelation. If he has a spirit without measure, so can we. May this second point cause you to love Jesus more than everything in this life. Because there are only two ways you can be like Jesus. One is through his grace and gifting that transforms us. The other is by our growth to experience everything that is necessary to experience that Jesus went through so that we can go through and receive the same. If you ask, can I be baptized with the same baptism of Jesus? My answer is, Potentially, yes. But it's up to whether how willing you are to go through everything that's necessary, to experience everything that Jesus had, to receive all that Jesus had. Some things are received by impartation, but some things I receive by experience. And as you experience and qualify yourself, you can become like Jesus. Point one is impartation through gifts. Point two is receiving by experiencing all that he experienced and paying the price for them. Sometimes paying the price can be difficult. Let the rich young man was asked to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, sell all you have and come and follow me. He could not do it. Today, he regrets it. In eternity. And Peter says, Master, we have left all and follow you. We left all our fishing boats and everything. And Jesus blessed them. Jesus said, You've given a hundredfold, you will receive a hundredfold. Surrender a hundredfold, you receive a hundredfold. In this life and in the next life. Oh, blessed be. To have absolute surrender all to Jesus. I surrender. May that be 24 hours in our life. In Jesus' name. Father, hear our hearts, not just our words. Hear our thoughts, not just our words. Hear our heart cry and desire to be like you. And cause us all to reach the fullness of Jesus so that we can do the works of Jesus. The earth and this world is crying for God. And we are those sent to represent our God. And we want to go out to show forth the message of God, both in our words and in our lives. In the other world, there is a God. We represent Him. Return back to the God of your creator. His name is Jesus. And do signs and wonders to demonstrate that God is calling his people back. 
his creation back to him. All creation is groaning for this day. And we are sent by you to this planet to bring forth a group of human beings to be presented to the Father as the bride of Christ. In these days of the tangles, let your kingdom be established. Let your will be done as it is in heaven. Let the Holy Spirit come in all the outpouring fullness to establish the bride of God. Who is worthy and equal, join as and as with Jesus, our bridegroom. To enter into the place that Jesus wants us to behold the glory of God as the only begotten. Oh, the bright New Jerusalem. To be in the very place where Jesus is. Nothing less. Because this is the fullness of what Jesus paid the price for. With his precious life and precious blood, he laid all for us to become exactly like him. And he can look at us and see a perfect reflection of himself. And we are the glorious bride without spot or rental. We are exactly 100% like Jesus in every way. Thank you. Let it be so in my life, in my loved one's life, in all these beloved saints of yours. In the life of all the six million people, please let them be more than 100 million, billion possible. All six billion lovers of God. And of course, all six billion disciples of Jesus. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name. Amen.